Evolution is a word that's very much in the air and has been around for, well, I suppose, ever since the revival made by Teilhard de Chardin. Um, and in our time, it's taking on a real importance um, and will need to be incorporated in a much more explicit and creative way into our theology and into our spirituality. And already it is a major part, really, of um, the emerging spirituality of our time. So these are some of the big names that are around today. So Teilhard de Chardin, <coughs> who back in the 40s or 50s said, Blessed be you, mighty matter, irresistible march of evolution, reality ever newborn, you who by constantly shattering our mental categories force us to go ever further and further in our pursuit of the truth. And many statements like that he made. Um, currently, the single finest exponent of Teilhard is Ilia Delio, a Franciscan sister um, with a long association um, with Drew University and other universities in America. And then this is uh, um, John Hort, um, and John has a long association with Georgetown University. He's now retired. And those are three uh, key names from the Catholic perspective at the present time, and also often consulted by the wider Christian community. Now, there is huge controversy goes on around this word and this notion, particularly in the United States. Um, so, I have identified three words here which captivate the heart and soul of what we're talking about. And by holding to these three, and the rather simple definition, we are getting quite deep down into it. Um, there, there are several ideas in, among the exponents of Darwinian evolution and notions like the survival of the fittest and so forth that are useful. But in a sense, these three words do captivate the heart and soul of what we're dealing with. In creation, everything grows. And we can experience that in our own lives. Growth involves change. And I think most people will acknowledge that. They'll understand it in slightly different ways. So for instance, in this year of 2019, sorry, of 2020, the person I was in 2013, seven years ago, is a totally different person. In those intervening seven years, every cell of my body has been replaced. But it all happened very gradually, so I didn't notice it. If it hadn't happened, I'd be dead. Change is essential to the ongoing work of growth. And the third word is complexity. And by that we can hear echoes of mystery, that everything is growing into a greater richness, a greater depth, a greater sense of mystery. Those three words captivate the essential essence of what we're talking about. So growth is painful, change is painful, but in the end nothing is as painful as staying stuck somewhere where we don't belong. In a sense we don't have much of a choice but to move with all this and to move with the general trust of where evolution is leading us and guiding us. So these are a few crucial factors in our understanding of evolution. There is no idyllic past to which we can have a utopian return. There was never a time in which things were perfect, because if there were, there would have been static, and we'd have ended up in a predetermined world, totally devoid of creativity, of freedom, of growth. We are in all probability, living in the best of all possible worlds. Even though it may not look a very nice place at times, but that probably has more to do with our faulty perceptions and our wrong sense of engaging rather than with the world itself. Evolution is lured from the future and not merely driven from the past. This is a major insight of John Hort. So from the Darwinian perspective, uh, we learn from the past we shed or we get rid of those things that didn't function very well or are not serving us any well anymore. The evolutionary adaptations and the choices made. For Hort, that is at best 50% of what evolution is about. 
and he claims the other 50% is the fact that we're lured from the future. And it seems to me that that lure is inspired primarily by what we call the Holy Spirit of God. So the drivenness from the past, yeah, we can verify that from the point of view of science, but for a more holistic view, I think our science needs to be supplemented or complemented by our theology. Then we have the bigger view, the deeper view, and in my opinion, the more authentic one. Co-evolution means a lateral process rather than a linear line in which different aspects of life help each other to grow, change and develop. That's what's meant by the word co-evolution. Humans do not control the process and that is a real shock for many of our power centered people and indeed for our academics too. It's amazing still there can be a rational fear that, that, that is still there very much in our species. We must know who's in control and who's in charge. The fear that things might be out of control. That is a very irrational kind of fear. And it's arising from a whole lack of education on what a more integrated understanding of life would look like and what we as a more integrated species would look like. Fifthly, we can choose to become its beneficiaries or its alienated victims. In other words, we learn to try and flow with evolution and in that way become its beneficiaries. Otherwise, we can very easily feel its alienated victims when we set ourselves over against it or try to pretend that we're superior to it. And then lastly, evolutionary growth is inescapably spiritual. And it's the energizing spirit of God that is the fundamental driving force within it, it seems to me. So therefore, the kind of shift we're looking at then from fixed truth in the past towards a more porous, more open, evolving truth from the lure of the future. From patriarchal rational certainty to relational peer consensus, where we seek the truth in more communal groups and networks. The truth that evolves through deeper discerning dialogue. The ruling sky god the earth-centered Great Spirit, the notion of the Great Spirit we take from our indigenous peoples around the world. And for them, the Great Spirit is not so much a transcendent being, ruling from above and outside, but rather that divine loving energy that the people feel in and through their connection with the soil, with the land, and with nature. Earth as an object belonging to the web of life is where our evolution is is moving us towards. Humans in charge, humans as servants to a process greater than ourselves. Religions return to perfection, evolving in the power of the spirit. And the spirit is always working with the chaos of creation, as we are reminded in the book of Genesis. Always, not about trying to fix it, but help to draw forth deeper meaning and uh, in the direction of greater creative complexity. Survival of the fittest, we are programmed to cooperate. Survival of the fittest can carry the notion of a lot of battling with wits and can at times uh, lead into a rather violent way of seeing and understanding. And then finally, a lot of these points are about control. And control is a lot, an excessive control, has an awful lot to do with irrational fear. The key word over here is trust. Can we trust the process? Can we trust the spirit calling us forth? Can we trust the inherent freedom and creativity that are part of the evolving process? Um, Elizabeth Saturis um, has come up with this understanding of uh, co-evolution in which she says, competition and cooperation can both be seen within and among species as together they improvise and evolve, unbalance and rebalance the dance. Evolution in this improvised dance in which ecological balance is worked out over and over again. 
Remember that living things have to change in order to stay the same. But nothing really stays the same, of course. They have to renew themselves and adjust to the changes around them. And this is what we call co-evolution, which is perhaps a better word than evolution itself. Um, so the evolutionary lure of the future, this is picking up a little bit more explicitly the work of John Hort. There's a universal expansiveness to everything in creation, which could be understood as a new mysticism in our time. Maybe worth remembering here that great challenge from Carol Rahner, the Christian of the future will be a mystic, or won't be at all. And by mystic he meant the ability to see, perceive, and relate with our God on that larger creative context. A spirituality, secondly, that's inclusive and empowering. But not just merely inclusive of other faiths and of other peoples and cultures, inclusive too of the entire creation and empowering for all sentient beings. A sense of global interdependence, that connectedness across all creation. Wisdom from the ground up and the trust and faith to trust that wisdom that comes from within even from very ordinary people, because we are all connected in some way or other with that deeper wisdom of creation. A new hunger for intimacy, I suppose you can see this in the social networking that goes on in the world. We can see it in the expansive horizon today of human intimacy through various uh, forms of uh, human uh, psychosexuality. Um, we certainly can see it in the birth of something like the United Nations, with the desire for greater nations to come together and cooperate more. But then sadly in our time we're also aware of greater fragmentation. Um, so we have the light and the shadow here that require a lot of discernment. From institutions towards networks is certainly a major movement of our time. And here I recommend the key work of Paul Hawken. H-A-W-K-E-N in a book called Blessed Unrest, which is a wonderful, inspiring study of the power of networking around the world, a millennial project that took about five years. Um, so when the United Nations developed the concept of the NGO way back in the 1940s, they were sowing the seeds for what today we call networking. A kind of a, um, an insinuation that a day may come in which big mega institutions won't serve us well and we will need an alternative. The alternative is the network or what they call the NGO. Meanwhile of course we have to deal with the impact on the power of mega corporations which in many cases have taken over from mainline governments in our time. From control to trust and mutuality which I've already mentioned and are we living in a new age of the Holy Spirit which is what some uh, contemporary spiritual writers and thinkers are suggesting. This is a great statement, for, which I believe is from Thomas Berry, but I haven't been able to find the exact source to it. He says, we are being changed. We're being adjusted to see everything in its proper proportion. We are being driven down to the heart with its radical interior tendencies. I think a lot of the patriarchal people in our world and our church would find that statement very frightening because it almost feels like this is something we are not in charge of. We are not in control of. There is a wisdom greater than ourselves at work. Can we trust it? Can we flow with it? Can we acknowledge its positive potential? And what's the wisdom we will need for that. And what's the spirituality that will be important if we're to become more integrated with it in an empowering way? Then these are some of the questions that arise. And finally, um, this gentleman from America, Carter Phipps, in what is a very readable book, um, he says evolutionaries are people that try to embrace this more open, generic way of being in the world or being in the church, or being people of faith. He says evolutionaries tend to be cross 
disciplinary generalist. In other words, you can't really understand anything anymore solely from the perspective of one discipline. In an ideal world, geography should be taught not merely in terms of landscape, but in terms of all the other creatures that inhabit a geographical space, of how they interrelate with each other, of what um, a symbi symbiotic human participation would look like in that context, how this particular geographical place links with the larger creation in terms of planet and so forth. A multidisciplinary approach is essential today for a deeper understanding of everything in life. Secondly, develop the capacity to cognize the vast timescales of history. An interesting one there is more and more people seem to be feeling at home with this big figure of 13.7 billion years. We roll it off our lips as if it's kind of ordinary lingo or conversation now. And a lot of people are acquainted with the idea of our Earth being 4 billion years, our organic life around for 2.5 or 2.4, whichever exactly it is. However, where we still have a bit of a blind spot and are not well grounded is when I tell people that we have a human story of 7 million years and not merely a few thousand. That's an expanded time horizon that we yet have to come to terms with. And I don't think we would begin to integrate the challenges of the other big scales until we also internalize that one in a more meaningful way. And then thirdly, embody a new spirit of optimism, the spirit of hope, the spirit of joy, the spirit of deeper meaning. 